Welcome to Biomechanics on Our Minds. My name is Melissa Boswell. And I'm Hannah O'Day, and we're PhD students at Stanford University. This podcast is brought to you by the International Society of Biomechanics. It's, it's time, time for, for Boom. Boom. Welcome to Boom. Where we have Biomechanics on Our Minds. Boom. 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 Hi. A very warm welcome to all our listeners on another episode of Student Voices on Boom. Who do I hear? Voices. Student is me. Voices. Student. Voices. 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 My name is Priyanka Agarwal and I'm a physical therapist and an early gate lab researcher at Ames, Delhi. And today, through this episode... I would like to highlight the interdisciplinary nature of biomechanics and how it inspires and encourages students from different fields and backgrounds to contribute and increase the level of understanding of fellow biomechanists. However, sometimes such students, uh, including myself, do not know how to proceed further or may not have the right mix of aptitude or inspiration or qualification for further studies or research and to ultimately become a good biomechanist. So hopefully, uh, by the end of this episode, we'll be able to answer some of those questions today. But before we start, I would like to thank uh, Melissa and Hannah, who have given me this wonderful opportunity to host this episode. To help me in this endeavor today, I'm joined by two guests who have had uh, nothing less than a translational journey of their own. Professor Rajiv Ranganathan, Assistant Professor of Kinesiology and Mechanical Engineering from Michigan State University, and Freya Watson, PhD student in human spine biomechanics at University College London, who actually is from a veterinary nursing background. Thank you so much for joining me today, uh, despite our different time zones and a little mix up. Um, Thank you for uh, yeah, having me. So, uh, Rajiv, if we can start with you, uh, would you like to tell us briefly about your journey from uh, engineering to rehab? Sure. Um, I I grew up in, in India and, you know, the, as the joke probably goes, you either do engineering or medicine. And that's that was my uh, sort of training uh, pretty early on. So I was training to be an engineer. Um, and then two things kind of uh, changed my approach, I guess. Um, the first one was uh, I was, you know, a big cricket fan being from, from India. And one of the things that was that happened when I was about 13, 14 was this uh, whole controversy about um, Mutaya Muridharan and whether his bowling action was uh, legal. And, and that, that storm kind of came up during that point. And I was kind of amazed to see that um, that science could be used to answer that question. And I still vividly remember um, seeing, you know, Mutaya Muridharan all markered up and, and there was a lab that could tell whether he was Know, bending his elbow or not and uh, that that kind of really stuck with me because until then I thought labs meant you know test tubes and pipettes and chemicals and it was really surprising to me that you could have labs that measure uh, human movement and then uh, a few years later when I was sort of starting my engineering uh, more per you know sort of on a more personal note uh, my my grandfather had a had a stroke and it was sort of uh, I witnessed first person how difficult rehab is, and um, I had sort of wanted to that that point um, try and do something to to help uh, help rehabilitation. So these kind of two factors um, guided me away from sort of the hardcore engineering sciences more towards uh, kinesiology. So that's how I got into a master's program in kinesiology at at the University of Illinois, and then I continued for. Uh, my PhD at, at Penn State. Right, so I think that's um, quite relatable. I think we are uh, our environment and uh, the experiences that we have from them, I think kind of uh, inspires us or motivates us to do something in that field. And uh, I think most of the students also, um, uh, even today, are probably um, half uh, have made the half the decision of. Uh, going into engineering or any other field and probably uh, by the end of their grad studies their undergrad studies sorry they are able to decide of uh, what to do next and probably not in the initial part so um 
Um, I would also like to ask you like a follow up question. Um, um, what kind of uh, like internship or even when you were in engineering, did you do something related to kinesiology? So as as a precursor for your MS. Uh, yes. Yeah, so during my my senior year, we had a <clears throat> we had a project where we had to use uh, image processing, and I, I thought I would choose something that uh, related to human movement. So uh, we did a project uh, looking at <clears throat> whether we could predict how high a ball would bounce uh, based on some initial release parameters. So if you gave it when the ball was released and its first bounce location, whether you could predict where the ball would end up. And this was sort of motivated by um, by research in eye tracking um, that that showed that, you know, bat, bat, batsmen can't track the ball throughout the trajectory. The ball's kind of moving too fast, so they have to make predictions about where the ball should be from slightly early on in the trajectory. So we were kind of, you know, I, I was trying to see if I could develop some sort of um, curve fitting type of models to see whether this is actually doable. Uh, so did your like uh, research interest took you to um, University of Illinois uh, where you did your MS or was it like uh, you got in Illinois and then developed your interest there? Um, that's a great question. So initially I was I was very interested in sort of really biomechanics, right? So measuring kinematics, forces, et cetera. So that's how I, I started when I went into the University of Illinois. I wanted to do uh, biomechanics. Uh, but uh, my mentor there, uh, Les Carlton, um, we, I mean, he was he was a great mentor. And, and we talked a lot about, about motor control, so how the brain actually does. So biomechanics was still an important part in trying to understand how people move. Uh, but I slowly became more and more interested in understanding how to how to make a change, right? So if if somebody had uh, a sort of maladaptive, or faulty movement pattern, how would we go about changing their movement patterns back? So I, I became really interested in that question. So I kind of transitioned a little bit from sort of pure biomechanics, if you will, more towards motor control and and motor learning. So uh, also, um, uh, I have to ask, as an international student, how challenging was the switch uh, from a, a different country and also a sort of different field? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, I initially, the first, I guess, couple of months were a little rocky based on, you know, just purely cultural transitions from how we used to interact uh, back in India to a new setting, and especially in a graduate school where um, you're, you know, you're almost considered an equal to the faculty in terms of coming up with ideas, you know, being able to challenge your uh, faculty mem- uh, members' ideas and so on. So, so that was, that was a, an interesting change. Uh, but in terms of the, the content, um, I, I was actually pleasantly surprised that um, a lot of people in the graduate school level were, were very interdisciplinary in kinesiology. So there were people who had backgrounds in engineering like me. There were lots of people who had like a psychology background or a physics background. So there were all these sort of, it was almost like a melting pot. So I didn't really feel out of place in, in any way. And, and the people who were sort of, you know, in kinesiology, um, they always sort of uh, were also looking for new things in terms of whether it be measurement of uh, new technology or, or something like that, where, you know, where we could help out in terms of, okay, you know, write a small code to do something. So um, it it was, it kind of worked really well for me in terms of having an environment where I could contribute, uh, but I was also uh, learning quite a lot. So I think that that really helped. So, yeah. Um, and uh, is, is there a trend and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, most of the, engineers are from mechanical and computer engineering and uh, I think your bachelor's was in uh, electronics and communications I think yes so uh, so did, did you feel that um, probably this uh, um, you know had a disadvantage or did you feel that this was an edge that you could have that you could have a different type of uh, approach to the same problem yeah I think it's, it's sort of more of the latter initially I was you know, like like you'd mentioned, I didn't have a sort of traditional mechanical engineering background, so I was worried about going into biomechanics and having to, you know, relearn all the basics of mechanical engineering. Uh, but but like I said, the more more I was in the field, I got sort of 
more towards motor control, which had lots of control theory, which was sort of something that I was somewhat familiar with. Um, and then, uh, you know, as, as you got more into sort of the neuroscience basis of it, it was sort of anyway new, uh, like no matter which branch of engineering I would have come from, it would have been new. So um, I didn't really feel that after a certain point, like I said, the first couple of months were, were sort of, you know, where you got used to it. But after that, I felt uh, sort of relatively comfortable after that. And uh, now that you're uh, an assistant professor and you're teaching both uh, mechanical and kinesiology, so uh, do, you, do you find there's a natural or an intentional crossover between the two fields, uh, probably where you want the students to be knowledgeable in both for a uh, better understanding later on? Or you, you like to keep some clear distinction between them? I think, uh, you know, the... the the time for making sort of clear cut distinctions is somewhat uh, out the window, at least, at least in my opinion, um, there's, there's really problems that, that need to be solved and they require a whole bunch of approaches. So it's sort of like you need to, you need to have the Swiss knife, right? So it's, it's, uh, I think it's helpful mm-hmm. for people to understand what the general problems in movement control and biomechanics are. And then, Learn, learn whatever is necessary to solve the problem. So I don't really make a clear cut distinction of well, this is this is kinesiology and this is biomechanics, and that's those things are are different. And I think, of course, from a coursework standpoint, you sometimes have different emphases. So, like when I teach my course in mechanical engineering, there's a more focus towards the measurement aspect, and so I don't go too much into the motor learning and those aspects. But that's purely from a coursework standpoint. Um, I think, uh, you know, for, for even in, in those kinds of courses, like when we do a final project where students get to choose what they what they want to study, a lot of them choose things that are sort of very, you know, interdisciplinary and crossover between engineering and kinesiology and neuroscience and so on. So, um, yeah, I think that having really hard distinctions is no longer the way to go. So I, th- I think that's a very healthy perspective and, and very forward and futuristic because uh, I've, I've seen psychologists and even musicians who are excellent at rhythm and coordination solve some of the really uh, big motor control problems. And uh, I think that that's what the interdisciplinary nature of biomechanics is all about. Yeah, exactly. Um, so all... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, so I think that those are those are really great examples just to show the sheer variety in contexts that, you know, when you think about motor learning and motor skill um, and how these skills are affected, say, after a stroke or other uh, neurological impairments, uh, it's just the whole spectrum and, and trying to understand uh, the this, this spectrum requires you to basically come outside of any specific type of... Uh, training, I think. Uh, Of course, you have your own core strengths in certain fields, um, but I think you you have to be able to speak the language of of the other other fields as well. So if if I would ask you if you could change anything from the journey that you've had, you you regret something that you would have done better, uh, would there be something that you could point out? Uh, (laughs) That's that's a good question. Uh, I, I... and I, I, I have to ask because, you know, a lot of people would not have the kind of uh, probably forward mindset as yours and they would be uh, they, have, they would be having a lot of questions. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't think I really regret anything big in terms of my journey. In fact, you know, I was I was quite fortunate, I think, that um, I was able to make the transition relatively smoothly and um, sort of make contributions as as I went along. Um, you know, you always think about, you know, the, the later in your career you get, the less time you have to learn new things. So, you know, one, one thing you always think about is whether you should have learned more, you know, whether it be Lagrangian mechanics or something like that. I mean, I, I don't use that on a daily basis, but, you know, I, I know that's a lot in, in, in yeah. mechanics. So you always sort of, I guess, have some wishful thinking about, well, I wish I could have learned this more so I could understand this better. Uh, but that's that's more, I think, a feeling that, faculty have in general as you know as they get older as they lose touch with some of the the current techniques but uh, but other than that i really don't have any any big regrets or anything that i would change a lot if i had to do it again 
Well, that's that's great. I mean, uh, no regrets is very good. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, what what was the first point of patient contact for you? Because you're coming from a quantitative field, and uh, was it uh, during your master's or your PhD? Uh, it was actually during my my postdoc. So both both my master's and my PhD, um, I studied sort of laboratory tasks usually using you know college aged adults. So I, I didn't really get into the the patient world. Uh, but once I uh, went for my postdoc at the Rehab Institute of Chicago, um, there um, I had to um, develop this interface for looking at hand function in. Um, stroke survivors. So that was my first uh, sort of, you know, from a research sense, um, working with with patients and looking at uh, hand function over over a period of time. So that was really my first uh, entry point into the patient world. And, and and how was your experience coming from a, this quantitative field into into patient dealing? I mean, did you find it odd or was it exciting? I, I think oh, it's, it's sort of all of the. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it was odd, but it was definitely both scary and exciting because, um, you know, you're you're doing something new, and you know that that always creates uh, excitement. But um, there, you know, there are lots of things I had to pick up in terms of interacting with patients, knowing. Um, what things they were comfortable doing and what things they may not be so comfortable discussing. And that was clearly a journey. And, and there were some excellent clinicians there at uh, at the Rehab Institute who helped me sort of navigate some of those tricky things. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it was a mix of both <laughs> uh, having having a lot of excitement, but also being concerned about whether, you know, you're doing the right thing, whether they would respond well and, and things like that. Before continuing with this awesome interview, Boom wanted to thank Sanford Health for their support with starting the Student Voices segment of Biomechanics on Our Minds. Sanford Health is one of the nation's largest health systems offering integrated care, genomic medicine, senior care and services, research and affordable insurance. And Sanford Health also offers both students both clinical and non-clinical internship experiences throughout the year, as well as graduate student training through a partnership with the University of South Dakota Department of Biomedical Engineering. These student opportunities include biomechanics internships through the Sanford Sports Science Institute and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine in Sioux Falls, South Dakota and Fargo, North Dakota, and provide mentorship, professional development, and growth opportunities, including gaining real-world experience and building useful skills to prepare you for the future. To learn more about student opportunities at Sanford Health, you can visit sanfordhealth.jobs. Yeah, so that's that's the clinical side of it. And, and Freya, you uh, you come from the clinical side, and uh, you have a bachelor's in veterinary nursing, which is quite a passionate field too. Uh, so, how was your journey coming into human spine biomechanics from that? Um, yeah, so uh, quite different from uh, Rajiv. I um, I had always wanted to work. Um, in veterinary medicine um, and yeah, I qualified as a veterinary nurse. I hadn't really at that time, I think I was um, looking back quite one track minded, I guess, because I felt like I was so sure that that's what I wanted to do. So I left university and I got a job um, in a um, neuroorthopedic veterinary hospital. Um, and then, but uh, I had, I had really enjoyed doing my undergraduate research project, um, but didn't sort of give too much thought about it. Um, and it wasn't until I was speaking to um, one of the consultant neurologists, um, you know, just just about sort of interest and in, in your future. And I heard I'd meant I'd mentioned to her that I that I really enjoyed uh, my undergrad project and but I wasn't really sure where to go with it. Um, and so it was her, um, she introduced me um, to sort of spoke about some of the research that, that she was doing. Um, and she basically offered um, that if I, if I was interested in pursuing research and wanted to do a research master's, that she would um, happily um, supervise me um, along with um, a, a colleague of hers who was based at the university. Um, I really, I really, really respected her and I really respected her opinion. Um, and that's when I thought, you know, I, I really did enjoy that project and um, that would be a really sort of stimulating avenue to go down. So at that point, I kind of jumped at the chance and that was then my introduction to academia. Um, 
and so I did my I did my uh, research masters part time. Um, so I was still working at the hospital um, alongside. And then when I finished um, when I finished my masters, I. I just found that I, I I really missed it. I really missed the academic environment. I really missed. I, I had really enjoyed the research process, um, you know, from right from the beginning, from planning a study and then to carrying it out. And you know, the the responsibility for learning all of the skills that you need, you know, because you're the only one that's going to carry the project through. So if you don't know how to do something, you have to learn it. And I found that really really rewarding. Um, and so then again, the same uh, the same clinician. She then uh, recommended that I did a PhD, which I thought sounded like a silly idea at the time, um, but it planted a seed. And so I um, so I ended up pursuing, uh, you know, looking looking to do a PhD. Um, by that time, I had become involved in some of the. Um, gate analysis research that was happening at the veterinary hospital that I was working at. Um, so they were looking at, uh, well, initially they had a, um, a single like fixed force plate in the ground um, and later on a um, strideway uh, looking, basically looking to objectively assess um, lameness in dogs, uh, whether it's sort of forelimbs, um, hind limbs, um, and I also got the opportunity to um, work with um, someone from the New- University of Newcastle who was looking at using wearable um, IMUs to um, who he was also interested in, you know, looking to see if we could use these to assess lameness in dogs. So I'd, I um, so I'd sort of come to a point where I really I really appreciated this, the clinical impact that that information gave, um, for, you know, for, particularly for patients that can't talk to you. They can't sort of advocate for themselves and point you where it hurts and, you know, tell them what activities are different, are difficult for them. Um, and, you know, I was really interested in how useful the clinicians found that information. Um, so I really enjoyed being able to provide that whilst sort of maintaining um, a really strong clinical contact um, with the patients and um, obviously their veterinary patients so with their owners as well. Um, so then when I was looking um, for uh, PhDs, the, the, the topic um, that came up, it was you know, sort of neuroorthopedic based and, um, you know, it's going to be looking at um, balance and wearable devices and how um, people with, you know, scoliosis move and, and balance. Um, and, I just, I just decided, I just decided to to go for it. It, it really interested me. Um, from from the beginning, I've really enjoyed any sort of medical science. I've just really enjoyed it and really enjoyed clinical work, and it seemed to tick all those boxes for me. So, um, yeah. And then I was I was fortunate enough to to get the position. So um, yeah. So I've just started my second year. So that's what I'm doing now. That's that's quite a journey, and uh, so uh, beyond learning on the job, uh, I must say that did did you ever feel that uh, probably a lack of a core quantitative background posed a problem, especially like in data analysis, coding, and did you ever feel the need to take some additional courses online or offline to complement your understanding? Um, yeah, I, uh, I I certainly could have done with. Um, you know, some core biomechanics uh, modules. Um, you know, if you say, what would you do differently with, um, you know, with hindsight that I, I would have done that because that would have been extraordinarily useful to me now. Um, so it was quite difficult. I, um, mo- I, I don't think I have learnt, I haven't necessarily sat down and learnt, learnt things formally, uh, but I've certainly put a lot of effort into establishing um, relationships with people who do have that ability and do have that knowledge um, so that they can either explain things to me if necessary or they can really point me in the right direction um, and they're really good um, sort of board to bounce ideas off of because you know they understand the the deeper mechanisms um, involved then um, so that's probably um, how the majority of my learning has has taken place um, and I certainly am nowhere near a finished product I'm still learning yeah I think that's that's great because I think collaboration and teamwork is actually quite the essence of biomechanical learning mm-hmm. and um, there's the force there's no harm in that but um, just for um, 
for an extra knowledge, you know, I actually did a little research and I came across these two courses and Rajiv, probably you can chip in because one of them were at Northwestern University. I suppose you've worked there for some time. And uh, there was this um, movement and rehab sciences program at the uh, Interdisciplinary Engineering Development Center for engineers who wanted to move towards rehab. Uh, do you, uh, you want to say a few words about that probably in terms of um, how uh, we can all achieve a goal of becoming better biomechanists and also for better opportunities? Um, yeah, sure. I, I, I don't know specifically about that particular program, but I know at, at Northwestern there's a the big uh, sort of push towards getting the engineering and the clinical sciences together. And, and the place that I was at, at the Rehab Institute of Chicago, was sort of one of the places where, you know, there was, you know, essentially the meeting of, of the of the two fields because there was, um, of course, it was a hospital, so there was lots of patient clinical work going on, uh, but the top floors were all full of, you know, engineers and kinesiologists and uh, all the other uh, scientists as well. So um, I think having a place that allows you to sort of get a, a at least a view of both worlds um, is especially helpful. It may not be very early in, in the career stage, but I think especially before you start your own independent career as a faculty, um, it's certainly very helpful to be in, in that kind of an environment because you learn so much more than what you would do at either place alone. Yeah, I, I would I would I'd really agree. I, um, I'm currently um, based um, in uh, the, the lab is the Center for Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology. So um, it's a really good mix of all sorts of engineers and all sorts of clinicians, um, you know, coming together, um, sort of looking at rehabilitation, which are um, sort of assistive technologies. Um, and I find that a really healthy environment. Everyone brings something different to the team and everyone's learning off of each other and I found that environment it really really helpful and and uh, just to balance it out I think there's another at Boston University for uh, non-engineers to go towards engineering and it's a late entry accelerated program and uh, so I think uh, bo both sides have I think um, equal representation I guess mm -hmm. or equal chances of uh, opportunities i think yeah i think in in either case it's a matter of you know people have their own skills so the engineers have their skills and you know non-engineers have their own skills but i think one of the key things when you're working on big problems is to be able to somewhat relate to another person's knowledge base and i think uh, being especially in sort of this you know, like here at Michigan State, I have a joint appointment in kinesiology and engineering. I mean, my main thing is in kinesiology, but the fact that I can sort of speak the engineering language helps me collaborate a lot better. And um, that, I think, is extremely helpful uh, at some point in, in your training process. So uh, another thing that... Um students uh, usually face is, um, including myself, where is that how do you how do you establish focus in such a interdisciplinary world? Because uh, like you said, that everyone has their own specialities. And at the same time, you have to have perspective on both sides. So uh, when, when students have switched courses or switched roles, uh, I do, do you think it um, sets a good um, example on paper? Uh, or maybe there, there's like, oh, the person has been all over the place, bits here and there, as compared to someone who's been on the same line of study for quite a number of time. I think this is a, it's a great question. There's clearly a, a fine balance here. Um, you, I guess on the one side, you don't want to be completely isolated in your own field and not have any idea of what's going on sort of beyond that field. But, but you are right in that there is also somewhat of a danger that you become a jack of all trades and a sort of master of none kind of thing. Exactly. So, um, I right. think it's, it's, a, it's a great point. And, and again, I think what I, I, gener I don't know if this is the right answer, but I guess one approach to doing it is to uh, sort of think of it as a, so sort of like a, a funnel. So you start off 
sort of establishing your core area. I think really that's really important so that anybody who wants to collaborate with you and else you on their team knows what they're getting. So I think having established that core skill set is is really useful. And then you can sort of then branch out and use that core skill sets or develop new uh, interdisciplinary approaches that then uh, sort of broaden uh, your impact. I think that's that's one way of looking at it. So that again, anybody looking in knows, you know, what does this person bring to the table? I think it should be clear from your CV or your resume that person's expertise is X, but they've also worked on these other problems. I think that helps in being an interdisciplinary world uh, so that people clearly can identify what, what your expertise is. True. And, and like you said, it's a fine balance and uh, it's, of course, uh, slightly tough to achieve. But let's let's hope that, um, you know, um, doing all this and having such a uh, interdisciplinary journey can, uh, you know, help us doing that. And so um, you've also, uh, Rajiv, uh, promoted science education in school students and uh, you've taken a few lectures back in India. Uh, so, and you have seen both sides of the spectrum. So, uh, what would be your uh, advice to a student uh, wanting to build up in a foundation in biomechanics, and especially when the STEM curriculum is being shifted towards STEAM with inclusion of arts? Yeah, I think there's. Um, I mean, I don't know if I have really. You know, advice is always tricky because what works for one may, may not work for everybody. But I think one clear yeah, approach right. is, uh, you know, like I said. Uh, develop some core skills that that are transferable. Right? So, um, computer programming surprisingly is one of those things that uh, I never thought growing up it would be that important. But now it's you know both during my graduate training and even now it's one of those things I almost use on a daily basis. Uh, same thing with like statistics. So, so you you kind of do your formal statistics courses, but you never really you know, think it would make that much of a difference. And and the last one I would say is is writing. Again, I never thought scientists wrote that much when I started my career, but it seems like, you know, after a certain point all you do is 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 write and you know you don't spend yeah. that much time in the lab anymore, That's unfortunately. True. But but it's sort of like one of those ground realities. So um I think being able to observe someone who's in that field, uh, sort of following their trajectory, uh that that gives people a good idea of what kind of skills they will need. So I would just suggest that people have enough exposure to different kinds of jobs, different kinds of environments, and that way they can have a good idea for what, what works best for them. All right. Uh, Freya, any advice for students from unconventional backgrounds? Um, I guess um, what what I try to do is, I, I guess similar to what Rajiv is saying, is I try to show um, on my CV and sort of, I guess, collect for myself um, core skills that could, you know, could be seen as um, as transferable to different areas. Um, I, I completely agree with um, the the statistics skills, um, and I'm certainly learning how important. Um, computer programming and things is and I'm trying to learn that as well um, and and uh, certainly you know the writing that I showed that I had I had writing experience and I tried to get some publications um, and experience there so um, and, and and also just to show that I was I was committed and I was driven and I could um, you know I, I I could sort of master my own time and, and be responsible and carry a project through to the end so it was kind of ticking all those boxes whether I whether or not I did them in the conventional manner or not um, you know I, I I could just show that I had those skills and that I had that experience that I would bring to a team and you know bring to my PhD right so uh, with this we have uh, come to the end of it uh, uh, we have also run out of time Rajiv you have to go I know but thank you so much for joining us today and uh, sharing your valuable advice with us and for all the listeners. So thank you. Thank you thank so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for having us. And uh, I would definitely like to end it with one quote from Harry Potter that it is not only our abilities that decide who we truly are, it is also our choices. So I guess all we have to do is choose wisely, combine it with the right attitude and inspiration, look deep into our lives, find those dots and connect them well. So thank you. Thank you so much.
Thanks for listening to Student Voices, a series by Biomechanics on Our Minds by students and for students. If you have an idea for an episode of Student Voices, or if you want to host your own episode, please reach out to us at biomechanicsonourminds at gmail.com or tweet at us at biomechanicsoom. We'd love to hear from you. Let's keep these conversations going. 